Blinkist is the app that helps you become a more well-rounded person by letting you read or listen to an entire nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. You can try it for free and get 25% off a subscription by going to Blinkist.com slash David Pakman. Let's start today with an update on how the pandemic is going in the United States and around the world. This is probably the, the least good update that we've had in a couple of months, uh, but it does require some thought and some explanation and there's some details to understand. So the, the top line, like the bad number, the number going in the wrong direction is cases, cases per day in the United States and around the world are now climbing once again. And after more than two months of declines and significant declines for much of that two, two and a half month period, average daily cases are again ticking up, not by that much. But from a low of about 55,000 new cases a day in the United States, now up about 5% to 58,000 cases per day. Remember, context, these are numbers many in 2020 thought we would never get to. We blew past them all the way up to 255,000 cases per day, came back down, and now we're back up from 55,000 to 58,000. What is driving this? We're vaccinating. Uh, we're vaccinating millions per day at this point, and we'll look at those numbers. How is it that cases are again going up? Couple of different things going on. One is that in some states, the more contagious British variant known as B117 is becoming more widespread. Now, remember that the vaccines work really well against B117, but among unvaccinated people, it's going to spread more. That's exactly what is happening, for example, in Michigan. Michigan is a place where B117 is becoming uh, more widespread as the variant of uh, of dominance. And Michigan's cases aren't just ticking up slightly. They're skyrocketing primarily again among unvaccinated people. Michigan cases are up 250 percent from a recent uh, low. So the other aspect of this is is more of a sort of uh, I guess you'd call it a psychological aspect in a sense. As people learn about vaccination and they hear that people are getting vaccinated and they hear that cases are coming down, some people choose to behave less safely. And there's an analogy here to something that traffic engineers deal with. When traffic engineers look at a stretch of highway or road, for example, that has a lot of traffic and they say we need more lanes in order to better accommodate traffic they will start a project to widen a road. And of course, people learn about the fact that the road is going to be widened and will have more capacity. And often what happens is that by the time that the road is widened, increasing capacity, more people because they have heard, hey, this road will have more capacity. So traffic will go down. More people choose to use the road. And so by the time that the road is done, you have more capacity, but traffic is moving just as slowly because more people are choosing to use the road. Similarly, we are seeing spring breakers in Florida, states rolling back all guidelines, et cetera, as cases started to come down because vaccination was going up and the seasonality effect. More people are behaving less, less responsibly, less safely, I guess we would say. And thus we are starting to see uh, cases tick back up. Now, despite cases going up, the good news is that deaths continue to decline for now. As we know, at this point, deaths lag cases by about three weeks. We're already three weeks out from cases leveling. Deaths continue to decline from their peak of about nearly thirty five hundred a day towards the uh, middle to end of January. Now down to about a thousand deaths a day. That is a decline of 70 percent, but the decline, the rate of decline is slowing down. And one signal that might not bode so well is in terms of people going into the hospital. New hospitalizations have also continued down, but the rate of decline is slowing down significantly. So this is a crucial period of about, I would say, two to three months is what most of the epidemiologists say. It's a battle of vaccination versus variants, and we have very good data about how good the vaccines are. I read yesterday a study uh, which tracked California healthcare workers after being vaccinated. And what the study found was that the fully vaccinated healthcare workers, meaning 14 days out from dose number two, something like 0.05 percent 
became infected. This is a group that's highly exposed working in healthcare settings around unvaccinated sick patients, very low rate of contagion among those who are vaccinated. So that's the good news. Vaccinations now averaging right around 2.5 million doses per day. That's a combination of two dose vaccines and single dose Johnson and Johnson. Uh, total 2.5 million doses per day. That number should continue to grow. Uh, it appears that it is going to continue to grow. But this is not a good time to start going crazy the way we've seen spring breakers do in Florida. So super zoomed out vaccinations up deaths down. That's good. Medium term hospitalizations leveling out, not declining that quickly lately. Cases up and vaccine distribution in much of the world. Not good. And um, ultimately, I mean, to really get back to normal as a global village, for lack of a better term, other countries are going to need to do well on vaccination. There are countries not expected to get significant access to vaccines until 2023, maybe wouldn't even fully vaccinate until 2024. Who knows what variants will be on to by then? So th this is a bigger issue. Now we're starting to hear you know, more about a vaccine equity and, and countries like the US and the UK hoarding vaccines and different issues. As I've said before, I think it's perfectly natural that countries would try to vaccinate their own people first. Uh, but there is no question that until there is more vaccine distribution globally, we are not going to be able to say that we have we have dealt with the pandemic. But let's keep vaccinating. Uh, all you can do here in the U.S. is what when you can get a vaccine, get one. That's what you can do. Uh, we have been hearing more and more over the last several weeks to month and a half or so Republicans and right wing media pushing the narrative of a crisis at the border and a surge in undocumented crossings. Last week, we covered House Minority Leader Republican Congressman Kevin McCarthy, who staged an event at the U.S. Mexico border said um, unaccompanied minors are coming to the U.S. in a crisis levels and the crisis was caused by Joe Biden. Kevin McCarthy said that uh, terrorists are coming in through the U.S. Mexico border border from Yemen, Turkey and wait, Yemen, Turkey and Iran. It was there was no actual evidence of that. But this is the narrative. It's been pushed by Fox News reporters during press briefings. It's been pushed in news reports. It's been pushed by Republicans at press conferences. Is this real? Well, the Washington Post analyzed Border Patrol data going back to 2012, and there appears to be no crisis whatsoever. There is no surge that we could link to Biden administration policy. What we are seeing is data that tracks a seasonal pattern. This is the time of year where there are more migrants attempting to cross and interacting with Border Patrol plus some what we might call pent up demand from the covid period last year when movement was just dramatically reduced. So if we look at a chart of encounters per month at the border, looking at the last few years and we're putting that up on the screen, what you see is that numbers went up at exactly this time of year in 2019. They did not in 2020 because of the pandemic. They went up slightly at this time in 2018. And that's the pattern. It's a pattern that's been observed for some time now. Yes, apprehended migrants are up 28 percent from January to February, but apprehended migrants were up 31 percent during the same period in 2019. It is true that the raw numbers are higher right now than last year and the year before. Remember, movement in general went down during the pandemic. So what you're seeing num number one right now is a resumption of movement. And number two, some backed up demand from people who did not move around last year. Now, let me be very clear because I know I'm going to get emails about this. I'm not saying we don't need total and complete immigration reform. We do. Uh, this doesn't mean uh, that Joe Biden has done enough to stop deportations. He hasn't. And I've talked about that. It simply is not the crisis that Republicans want you to think it is. It's the crisis that we've had in this country for a long time, combined with a lack of comprehensive immigration reform, which I and others have been calling for for just as long of a time. What Trump did last year with Title 42, which is uh, using the pandemic as a reason um, uh, to turn people around and deport, it seems to have delayed people from coming. 
not stopped people from coming, period. That's the story. Many of them are coming now, not because Joe Biden is president, but because the pandemic is to some degree easing almost identical to Joe Biden's surge in gas prices last week, which we covered uh, uh, earlier this week. We are seeing gas prices go up. It's not because of Joe Biden. They started going up in October when Donald Trump was still president. And what we're seeing is demand for gasoline recover as the pandemic starts to ease. It has nothing to do with Joe Biden. So serious media should really just report this based on facts, but without using the language that the right uses. You know, when you talk about border crisis, it's sort of like Sleepy Joe and China virus. These are terms that the right uses to frame the debate in a particular way where you're no longer questioning whether there is a border crisis. You're merely arguing as to whose fault it is and to what degree it exists. And this is how the right does really well at framing issues. It keeps Republican voters enraged. It doesn't really allow solutions to the problems, however. So call it a predictable seasonal pattern that we've observed for a decade, bolstered by the uh, waning of coronavirus to some degree. And um, even non like what we even what we would call non right wing media is using a lot of the terms of the right when they talk about this. And as I've talked about before, using their don't let them even set the agenda and narrative by using the language. And that's what they uh, successfully have done on so many issues for decades, as we've talked about with people like George Lake and Thomas Frank here uh, on the program. So don't fall for it. Here's the data. The data is clear. Um, and, and we're going to con continue to track that data tomorrow, Friday. Finally, the day is here. The one day David Pakman show membership special. We are doing a massive blowout of memberships. We're hoping for massive membership dumps tomorrow. If you want to be notified of a one day, I, I hesitate to even say that it's a moral discount. I believe the discount we're offering tomorrow is immoral. It's vaccine themed. If you want to be notified tomorrow morning, just get on my newsletter at davidpakman.com. What if you could read 10 books in just one sitting? That's exactly what one of my favorite apps lets you do. It's called Blinkist. And what they do is take thousands of popular nonfiction books. They condense them down into text or audio that you can consume in 15 minutes. Blinkist makes sure that you're getting all of the important core insights from each book. So it's perfect for exploring a book you otherwise wouldn't have time for there's a full book you're thinking about buying, you can use Blinkist to get a sample first. Just think how much you can enrich yourself by being able to soak up an entire nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. I recently read A Brief History of Time, of course, by the great Stephen Hawking. This is a book that I have been aware of for so long and other things got in the way. And it was fantastic to check it out on Blinkist. Blinkist has books on politics, philosophy, science. They have 27 different nonfiction categories and a subscription is only about eight bucks a month and you get the entire library. But you can try it totally free and get 25 percent off a subscription when you go to Blinkist dot com slash David Pakman. I've put the link right underneath this video. Never forget that the David Pakman show's primary source of revenue is not a money tree on which dollar bills and half dollar coins grow. Uh, it's not big corporate sponsorships. It's mostly just people like you, viewers and listeners who sign up at joinpacman.com. So consider yourself invited. Grab a membership at joinpacman.com. You can also join the discussion on the David Pakman show subreddit, which you can find at davidpackman.com slash reddit. That's R E D D I T. Nearly 30,000 of our viewers and listeners are now subscribed free to the David Pakman show subreddit. Some interesting posts. I like this one. Someone posted two Davids will never see on Fox News again. Me after my last Fox News appearance and David Leopold, the immigration attorney who we covered earlier this week, who called out Fox host Judge Janine Pirro over the weekend. Uh, I think that is fair to say. I don't think I will ever be back on Fox News. Actually, you know, I don't know that I don't think I'll be back on the weekend news hours. 
the Fox Fox really, you know, each show is its own thing. I think it's plausible that I'd be back on some other show, but I don't think they'll have me back on the weekend America's news headquarters after my last appearance. And yes, I don't think David Leopold is going to be back on Fox News anytime soon. User Portland hipster suggests that I start referring to Donald Trump as a former one term President Trump and that it will trigger, quote, right wing cucks. Yeah, I think that the syntax former one term President Trump, um, the I think that it makes more sense to say the one term former president Donald Trump or just the one term president Donald Trump. Um, yeah, I, I like that idea. I think that that's definitely an adjustment that uh, I, I would easily be able to make on the show when referring to Donald Trump and then user. Ah, what the cheese posted about anti vax math, pointing out that the U.S. has seen 30 million dollars. Th I'm sorry, 30 million dollars, 30 million confirmed coronavirus cases. The real number could be anywhere up to, you know, two to three times higher than that. Five hundred and fifty thousand covid deaths. 125 million vaccine doses administered. Now it's closer to 130. 1900 vaccinated people that died and no one that we know of who has died from the vaccine. And yet anti vaxxers somehow seem to think that the vaccine might be more dangerous to them than coronavirus. Yeah, of course, the math doesn't work. And what you have to also remember even about. So there's a lot here that's even understated, right? We have no deaths linked to the vaccine. That's true. But even deaths of people who died after being vaccinated, uh, when you vaccinate tens of millions of people by sheer math, some of the vaccinated people will die from an actuarial perspective of old age, of other conditions, et cetera. So um, I, I think that it's very important to put this math in perspective. It's also important to remember, you know, on anti vax math, what else are anti vaxxers scrutinizing to the degree that they claim to be scrutinizing vaccines and ingredients and this type of thing? Are, are, I mean, do they ever eat junk food? Do they understand what all of the elements are in junk food on the ingredient list when they buy shampoo, when they buy skin creams and toothpaste and whatever? Are, are they scrutinizing the um, uh, 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 I don't know if they're called ingredients when it comes to health and beauty products, but are they scrutinizing everything that is in those products to this degree? There's definitely a uh, it, it's sort of like sometimes people become uh, there's this thing orthorexia where people become fixated on diet to a degree that that's unhealthy. It's almost like a diagnosable condition. And you start to wonder, you, you know, what else do you obsess about to this degree in your life outside of your diet? And maybe we should apply some context. I think the same thing applies to many anti vaxxers where great. You're really concerned about um, uh, what what's in the vaccines. That's fine. Are you equally concerned when you get antibiotics? Are you equally equally concerned when you buy Tylenol? Are you equally concerned when you look at junk food? Have have you ever looked at the ingredients in zebra cakes? Uh, and I'm kind of half kidding. Maybe zebra cakes don't have anything that crazy in them. I used to love those as a kid. I really did. Zebra cakes. Anyway, join the discussion um, on the David Pakman show subreddit, davidpakman.com slash reddit. I have for you today possibly the dumbest segment in Newsmax history. Newsmax is one of these sort of like a lower rent Fox News more extreme, by the way, if you can imagine. And uh, this was an interview that two Newsmax hosts did with Dick Morris. D I have to tell you, Dick Morris is kind of a sad character at this point. Dixon is mid 70s now. He's not super present publicly. But Dick Morris was like a big Clinton fr friend in the early 90s who eventually had a falling out with the Clintons, turned against the Clintons, but also became kind of a right wing apologist. I won't necessarily say he is a right winger, although after watching this interview, it sounds like he is, but certainly a right wing apologist. I interviewed Dick Morris a few years ago. He hated my line of questioning so much that he hung up on me. You can find that interview on my YouTube channel. So Dick Morris appears on Newsmax right after the Colorado shooting. Now, first of all, the segment, this segment existing at all, aside from what Dick says, which we will look at, the segment existing is part of the silliness. Newsmax and Fox and others, they've been covering the Colorado shooting where we found out the shooter is Muslim 
totally differently than the Georgia shooting where the shooter is white and the victims were minorities. But I'm for this segment, I'm putting aside the structural hypocrisy and we're going to focus just on what is said during the interview. So let's jump right in and look at the first clip murderers and their willingness to continually make excuses for them uh, to uh, your thoughts. Well, there's a overwhelming point here, which is that uh, the killer was a Syrian refugee and Donald Trump banned refugees from terror sponsoring countries like Syria and Donald and Joe Biden has opened the floodgates again, letting them in. And in fact, with specifically earmarking refugees, he's increased the number of refugees that can come into the U.S. by a factor of seven or eight. So Dick Morris's argument is that the shooter in Colorado is exactly the type of person that Donald Trump banned from the United States. But Joe Biden is now welcoming to the United States. The Colorado shooter was three years old when he came to the United States. He was radicalized in the United States or he became, you know, uh, if we want to go the mental illness route, he, he, he uh, developed his condition in the United States and is essentially an American. I mean, look, I came to the U.S. when I was five, so I was two years older than the Colorado shooter. My upbringing has been shaped here. My education is mostly in the United States. My political views, my interests, my social circle, it's all been shaped here. The Colorado shooter was even younger than I was when he came to the United States. What on earth does this have to do with Syria or Donald Trump's ban or Joe Biden? And if you can believe it, it gets even dumber. Let's continue. The other point I want to make is if the Democrats are so worried about gun violence, the, the most important thing you can do about gun violence is to institute the stop and frisk policy that New York City had until the Democrats forced it to be out to, to be stopped. OK, so now Dick Morris says let's use stop and frisk. We're talking about mass shootings here, individual gun homicides, handgun stuff. OK, like you can you can talk about stop and frisk. Of course, the problem with stop and frisk, as we saw in New York, is its application was extremely racially biased. But this segment is about the causes of a mass shooting that took place with a rifle. Does Dick think that police will stop mass shootings with rifles with stop and frisk? where police just stumble across a random guy with a gigantic rifle in his pants on his way to a mass shooting. It's ridiculous. And then it gets even more ridiculous where the cop actually sees somebody on the street with a gun in a high crime area very late at night and can stop them and see if they're armed. If they're not, they let them go. If they are, they get um, they get arrested for a mandatory three year sentence for carrying a loaded firearm in the city of New York. Now, did you hear what Dick said there? Stop and frisk is where police can stop someone if they see them walking around with a gun. That's not stop and frisk. That's you see someone with a gun and you inquire as to the legal status of the gun. But then Dick says they frisk them and if they have a gun, they get arrested. But Dick, you just said stop and frisk is police see someone with a gun and they stop them. But now you're saying stop and frisk is if they have a gun, after you frisk them, you arrest them. It's making no sense. And of course, its application to mass shootings is zero. Let's look at a little more of this. And this is funny because the host actually says the Colorado shooter was only three when he moved to the U.S. It doesn't slow Dick Morris down even one for a moment. Yeah. You know, um, Ahmad al Alissa, he uh, moved here to this country when he was just three years old. Uh, but because of some recent activity of his, he was actually on the, the spectrum of the FBI. So this is another case that the FBI was aware of him or at least people near him and watching him. But yet this was still allowed to happen. That's another conversation that a lot of folks aren't having. Yes. Well, I think the the point is that he comes from a country that sponsors terrorism, Syria. Uh, his parents did and brought him here at a young age. But that is precisely the kind of immigrant that Joe Biden is letting in. And Donald Trump wanted to bar. So Dick Morris hears the kid was three when he came to the U.S. and the FBI was aware of him. 
But he's sticking with this is why we don't let Syrians into the country. So the real story there is that yet again, the FBI has their eye on someone and that individual still can get guns more easily than you can register to vote in some states with a waiting period on voter registration. Right. There are states where you can't register and vote on the same day. You have to register in advance and later vote. But you can decide same day to go get a gun and walk out of the store with it that that day on the FBI's radar and still was able to do that. But Dick Morris says the problem is, I guess we don't have stop and frisk. And the kid came from Syria when he was three. And that relates to Joe Biden in some way. I have to tell you, Dick Morris has become sort of a sad figure in politics and Newsmax allowing him to also expose his incompetence um, only makes it sadder, but making no sense whatsoever. And the Newsmax host standing aside and letting him do it. We'll have more on this and I would love your reaction. You can follow us on Instagram at David Pakman show and uh, we will have maybe we'll have a uh, an, an additional clip of this interview. It's really something to see. Find us on Instagram at David Pakman show. Find me on Instagram at David The number one funding source for the David Pakman show has been and continues to be membership and membership is not just a feel good thing. You get access to the world famous bonus show every single day just for members as well as commercial free audio and video feeds of the show day in and day out. You can sign up for membership very, very quickly at join That's join P A K M A N dot com. If the normal prices strike you as high, by all means, use the coupon code better 21, all one word, all lowercase. Become a member today. Today, we're welcoming back an old friend of the show, Ben Dixon, host of the Benjamin Dixon show. Uh, ben, always great to have you, David. It's always a pleasure. Glad to be back. So, OK, I mean, how's Joe Biden doing so far? You know, <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's a loaded question. But, you know, if you if you actually are dealing fairly with Joe Biden, he's had some good and he's had some bad. Yeah, um, I am. Um, there are a lot of people who are really grateful to have the uh, the stimulus checks. Um, and he, while it wasn't as much as we wanted it to be and while it wasn't it didn't include 15 an hour, it still helped a lot of people. And there are some good things in it, right? There's uh, the the attack that they have on poverty, right? There, this bill is supposed to cut child po childhood poverty by 42 to 45 percent. We'll see how that does. So I have to give them thumbs up on that, even though it's not everything mm -hmm. um, I think is really beneficial. So one of the big things that was missing from the stimulus bill was the $15 minimum wage. My view on this is that the problem is that the Senate Democrat, the group of Senate Democrats just isn't left enough. It's not right. that Kamala didn't push the parliament, override the parliamentarian, because we saw with the vote that Democrats just didn't have the votes for fifteen dollar minimum wage. So for me, it's less about, oh, Joe and Kamala backed off by not overriding. It's there aren't enough. Democrats in the Senate who want a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Do you see it that way, or do you think they should have pushed the par overridden the parliamentarian? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think they should have overridden the parliamentarian, if for no other reason than to give us the fight that that we wanted and that we needed on that issue. However, you're not wrong because then it would have been um, Kirsten Sinema, uh, Joe Manchin yeah. and the other six who sabotaged it before. And, and so but that does speak to a bigger, broader problem. Like we are going to have to send more progressive leaning senators there to get things done. And they absolutely are going to need to overturn or abolish the filibuster or at least amend it if they want to get anything done going forward. Yeah, I want to talk about filibuster, but just to play out the overriding mm -hmm. in practice, we got the vote on including the minimum wage anyway. So we have a record of who voted. No, yeah. wouldn't yeah. the override just have created the fight, but in the in the end, just delayed getting people the cash. 
Well, you know, it depends on the, the timing of it. Like it could have delayed it a little bit further, but also it would have, it really would have shown. And, and, and again, you make a great point. We know the eight people who opposed it. Um, but then also it would have been, it would have been a little bit more pressure because at that point it could it come down to a, uh, it, could, it came down to the 50 vote versus what they needed in terms of the 60. So it gives them an opportunity to, it really gave the Democrats an out in the long run, and it leaves the suspicion that mm. perhaps they didn't want to do it anyway. Right. Um, but that's in the weeds. And like again, there are a lot of people who are just grateful to have these checks because it took. I mean, we're we're so far into this pandemic, and uh, sixteen hundred versus two thousand fifteen dollars an hour. A lot of people want it. We can come back to it, but absolutely. I mean, we. I'm glad they got it done. Yeah. If it had not happened, probably within five to seven days of when it did, it probably yes. goes on a list of failures for Joe Biden. No, absolutely. Because, you know, it, the, the clock was ticking the same, you know, my side of the equation. We were putting pressure on him from everywhere. Like what we wanted 15 an hour and we wanted those checks back in January. Like, yeah. You know, so, you know, they 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 did what they could do. And there's still enough good things in that bill that I think are going to have structural impacts, especially on childhood poverty. I, I can't overestimate that or, or overstate that uh, because that's a really significant move. And they are making they're giving us signals that they want that to continue even after this bill has um, run its course. So filibuster, there's the option of eliminating the filibuster with the pros and cons that come with that, including what happens the next time that Republicans are in control. Yeah. There's the idea of reform of the filibuster, like, for example, requiring it to be an actual talking filibuster rather than right. popping in and extending debate and then and then leaving. There's the idea of you need 40 in the chamber to do it rather than the absence of 60 keeps it going. Where are you kind of coming down on this debate right now? You know, I for all intents and purposes, the willingness to even from Joe Manchin, the willingness to at least amend the filibuster so that it is at a minimum a talking filibuster um, is a positive signal. However, there are just so many impediments to to the actual progress that needs to happen immediately, especially coming from Georgia. Like we absolutely are going to have to pass some type of voting rights legislation. It's got to, I know we already have HR one in the house. It's got to pass the Senate and the Republican party absolutely will use a, a talking filibuster and they will tough it out in order to kill that bill. So I think while it is encouraging that they want to amend it at a minimum, I don't know that a standing filibuster is going to be enough to actually beat back the uh, the desires of Republicans to suppress the vote across the country. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. And actually, th in thinking about a lot of the possible big uh, initiatives that Joe Biden is considering. So last week we heard maybe the next big thing will be the tax reform plan. Right. This week we heard it might be a three trillion dollar infrastructure plus schools and families. Um, now there's a lot more discussion about gun control in light of, of yeah. the two shootings on most of these things. I'm expecting Republican support to not be close to zero, to be literally zero. Yeah. Given that, how should how should Joe Biden and Democrats even account for that in thinking of what to approach next? No, I, I think they honestly are going to have to play hardball. And of course, see, the, the, the fear of the Republicans, uh, Mitch McConnell did that uh, a couple of videos uh, twice, making threats about what they would do if yeah. the filibuster is abolished. I think the, re the response to that from Democrats should be abolish a filibuster and run campaign ads every single day, letting Americans know exactly what Republicans want to do if they ever get back in power. So I think they're going to have to play some serious hardball and leverage the actual majority in this country to ensure that they don't get back in power in the near future. One of the things I've been thinking about is trying to get out of like our politics bubble where we follow this stuff in a way that yeah. most people don't and thinking like, for example, the debate around whether covid cash passes with 60 or with 50. Right. No one who was waiting on the 1400 cares that it passed with 50 instead of 60. Right? right. And along the same lines, when you think about something like gun control, we know gun control is less of a voting issue for people on the left 
than it is for people on the right. The right weaponizes it, whether or not Joe Biden's doing anything. They're saying Biden's coming for your guns either way. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Taxation, as an example, the narrative of Biden's raising your taxes, even if they're not really going up for 98 percent of households or, or whatever the case may be. Do you think that Joe Biden should be thinking about which of his ideas are voting issues versus which are not? Or should he just be doing what he thinks he can get done? Actually, that's a really, a, a really great question. And thank you. It is 1400 versus the 1600. I, I honestly think that he needs to just simply strike at what is going to be the best interest of the people, because this is a really good time where what he does that's in the best interest for the majority of the American people is actually really good politics. Even if you do have the Republicans on the other side of the aisle, who are going to weaponize literally anything. They're going to call him a socialist when he's Far from that. They're going to say he's coming to take their guns when he's not going to take their guns. We're talking about like a universal background check, which, you know, we're talking about issues that have like 90 percent approval rating in some categories. So, you know, he needs to play hardball with them and make his appeal to the American people in a very direct way. They need to communicate it. They need to go across the country and make sure I know we're in a pandemic, but they need to make sure they take credit for all the good things that they're going to do, because if they don't, Republicans will will vote against it and then try to take credit for it. So on immigration, immigration to me feels like if you watch the press briefings and you see how reporters, some reporter, even even not right wing reporters are adopting the language that's been established by Republicans about a crisis at yes. the border. We looked at the Border Patrol data seasonally. This is when crossings go up. You also have some kind of pent up demand from 2020 where there was very little movement because of the pandemic. So it all seems in the range of what you would expect seasonally. Crisis to me is is the wrong word, but right. I think they realize they're getting the most traction with it. And so that's why they're continuing to go with it. Kamala Harris now is being put in charge of, of handling what's going on at the border. What exactly what are the options even for what Joe Biden could and, and should be doing there? You know, it, despite his options, because it is a complicated issue and it yeah. is a matter of capacity and the speed with which they can actually move, particularly children through yep. the system and make sure the children are not there longer than they're supposed to be there. There is a very nuanced and problematic issue there at the border in terms of processing and logistics. Yeah. There is no crisis, though. And I appreciate you stating that because even you saw MSNBC, they're they're using this language. Joe Scarborough has started using this language. And it is a throwback to uh, the Obama administration when this is literally the number one way they wanted to attack President Obama because it does gain traction and it plays well with the conservative base. But that goes to the, the right wing, inherent right wing framing that we get from mainstream media anyway. Right. And the, the irony of it is, of course, these headlines were not being promulgated during the Trump administration, right? Uh, when the numbers, I'm sure if we look at the numbers, there's going to be some overlap in terms of comparability. But now it is a talking point because this is all they have. This is what they're going to do. And so we need to look at the, we need to question these mainstream media outlets that are now shifting to the same paradigm where they are creating a crisis with their headlines versus the reality of the data. Yeah, to me, the, the crisis language that's being used is not that different than China virus and Sleepy Joe in the yeah. sense that the way you describe it is what frames it even for people who are questioning what Peter Ducey says during, you know, the Jen Psaki press briefings or whatever the case may be. But for me so far, if you say what's the biggest mistake Joe Biden has made or the biggest failure, it's that, yes, he did do the executive order on removals and deportations. And then the Texas judge said, no, the, the justification is no good. And Biden's not done anything since when I've read a lot of really good legal analyses that are Biden could redo those executive orders to, right. to stop that with different legal justifications and really put courts in a position to say none of these justifications are valid. He just did one executive order and has kind of stepped away for now. I, I don't like that. That's for me one of the biggest things I think he's done wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that that would be one of the number one things. The, the, the number two thing is the willingness to confront the issue head on for the difficulty that it actually is. I think Jen Psaki doesn't really do um, a, a really good service to the administration by trying to prevaricate around the complexity of the situation versus right. just simply saying that we don't have the capacity that we need to actually get these children out of these cages as soon as we, you know, it's just really direct language is really necessary at this point because if, if they're prevaricating, 
dominating too much, then we're going to see these images and it's not just going to be the right. It's going to be a lot of people on the left and justifiably so, because if we see these images, we may not know the the technical difference between what's happening right now and what happened during the Trump administration. What we see are people in cages. And I think they have to just do the very difficult job of being straightforward and expanding the capacity. Don't just tell us the truth. Help us change the structural problems that are underneath it. One of the things I would like to see would be to see Jen Psaki better prepared to lay it out and say, listen, the system we were handed was a disaster yes. already. We want to fix it, but that will require, quote, growing government. But the Republicans are also against that. Yes. So the only way to do what they want us to do is by expanding resources, hiring more people, maybe in the short term, having more facilities. But they also say we need small government. So how is it that they expect it to be fixed if we can't do any of the things that need to be done? She doesn't. She sometimes she will say it's complex, but she'll never really frame it in those terms. Right. So and, and, and then trust the American people to handle the complexity. Right now. I know that's asking a lot. All yeah. things considered. But have you seen this, the interviews with anti-vax people? <laughs> uh, I know. I, I know complexity I, not, is not playing well right now. Well, but complexity will will do well for the people who are actually genuinely concerned about. Yeah. It, right. You're going to have bad faith actors on both sides of the equations that no matter what this administration does, they're going to get attacked for it. That said, there are some of us who actually are simply concerned about making sure that not it's not even just about keeping promises, but we're doing the absolute best that we can for the human lives that come and seek asylum in this country. And so for those of us who are operating in good faith, we can handle a moment of complexity versus, you know, kind of dancing around the issue. Have you been surprised by how effective uh, the right wing media apparatus and Republicans are at getting an idea to trickle all the way down to what I would call random Republican voters in diners in Oklahoma, like when CNN goes in and they do it, they interview diners in Oklahoma or in, in Idaho or whatever. And ideas that start with like, you know, Jim Jordan and Lauren Boebert and Fox and friends about yeah. either a crisis at the border or stuff about mandatory vaccine, whatever. It gets so quickly to just random Republican yeah. voters in Oklahoma who just accept it. Yeah. You know, it's it's a continuation of the same echo chamber that they've mastered over the last 40 years. I mean, it, it used to start with Rush Limbaugh and now, it, it you know, it's being regurgitated from through social media and yeah. on YouTube, like YouTubers have the same talking points. Uh, people on Twitter have the same talking points. I mean, randoms like and here's the other side of it, uh, uh, David. You now actively have citizens through social media contributing to and seeking out those talking points so that they can have something to say to their aunt that they don't like who's a liberal right. on social media. So they're 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 indoctrinating and, and, and propagandizing themselves. What's funny about that is for the last at least four years, but arguably longer, the Republican Party has not been about policy, but it's been about preventing the left from doing anything and mm -hmm. making the left look bad. That's almost the ideology now of the random Republican voter at Thanksgiving who is yeah. not so much interested in policy, but in about what can I say to embarrass oh, yeah. my liberal cousin or whatever the case may be. Yeah, no, it's very personalized politics at this point. And it's it's it, the analogy of football teams couldn't be any truer because they're special pleading on behalf. I mean, they, they don't care that it's illogical. They don't care if it's downright a lie. They just need something so that they can post to own the libs. And yeah, that no, might be their no family question. members. <laughs> and uh, then if it turns out that it's disinformation not allowed on social media, the fact that they're not allowed to post it oh, yeah. becomes part of the story that they tell. Oh. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's no greater grievance than a conservative who has been <laughs> flagged for uh, propaganda. Right. Uh, that that um, we, that will be interesting to follow also, actually, during during the Biden administration. Get one last thing on this. I've been thinking. OK, so they want to solve cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Is there any, quote, solution that is not incredibly authoritarian uh, government involvement in private business? I, I mean, they're. Oh, you mean for them to solve? Cancel exactly. Culture. When they say we need to fix cancel culture on social media, how do they imagine it being done without regulating the hell out of these platforms in a way that they claim to oppose? 
You know, I think what they really want is just to be able to use the N word and not get in trouble. I think that would, I think that's their standard. So maybe if you allow that, they'll if, they'll forgive the other yeah, stuff. Like yeah, like that, that's the end of cancel culture for them. Right. They want to be able to say anything they want to say without any responsibility. So I, I mean, the amount of government that would be required to come into, you know, private corporations, private jobs, and and to manage. No responsibility for uh, it's just a mess thinking about it. Yeah, it's they want freedom from the consequences of speech, even if it's someone else's speech. That exactly. that is the consequence. Yeah. Absolutely. We've Absolutely. been speaking with Ben Dixon, host of the Benjamin Dixon show. You can find him on, of course, YouTube occasionally on TYT. Where where else? What's your like main hub right now? Would you say uh, I would say my main hub is uh, the podcast format is still one of the strongest sides. So anywhere you get podcasts, iHeartRadio, uh, Spotify, all those places were there. Ben, always great having you on. Hey, thanks for having me, David. The David Pakman Show is audience supported media and you can contribute any amount you want on Patreon, as little as one dollar per month. Plus, you can get the daily bonus show, world famous at this point, and the daily commercial free TV show by making those pledges at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. This is audience supported media. We depend on the support of our viewers and listeners. Whether you listen to the podcast, watch on YouTube or watch us on TV or even listen on the radio, Patreon.com slash David Pakman show. We now have video footage from the January 6th Trump riots in Washington, D.C., which confirm that a close ally of radical Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene was not only there, but he was inside the Capitol building. You might remember that we previously discussed that a gentleman named Anthony Aguero was suspected of being inside the Capitol building. And Aguero is a known associate of Marjorie Taylor Greene's. He's a right wing. I guess we'd call him like a right wing live streamer and activist. And when back in February, CNN asked him, were you actually inside the Capitol building on January 6th? He didn't answer. And he said, you know, there have been videos posted uh, which I was supposedly filming from inside the building, but they were really filmed by someone else. He sort of played coy and didn't answer. We now have videos of the riot in which it is clear that Aguero was personally inside the Capitol building in the screenshot that we're putting up on the screen from Freedom News TV. You see Aguero highlighted by a red circle on the left side of the screen, clearly inside the Capitol building. Now, Aguero has declined to comment on this. Marjorie Taylor Greene's office has not yet responded to requests for comment. But this is now it's no longer hypothesis. It's no longer speculation. It's no longer theory. This is a confirmed Trump rioter who is also an associate of a current pro Trump Republican congresswoman who has been heavily defended and propped up by the former one term president, Donald Trump, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Aguero previously worked on anti immigration issues. They've been to pro Trump rallies together. And I previously told you about videos in which Marjorie Taylor Greene referred to Aguero as amazing and as a friend. And as CNN has reported, Aguero has called Marjorie Taylor Greene, quote, one of my closest friends. So now we know he was there. We know that a Marjorie Taylor Greene ally was in the riots. Now what? Well, the next question is actually one that goes back to a prior question that we still don't have an answer to. Were there current pro Trump members of Congress who were involved in discussions about the plans for the Trump riot ahead of time? Were some of these pro Trump Congress people not merely indifferent to the riots, not merely supportive of the riots after the fact. But were any of them actually proactive uh, participants in the planning of the January 6th Trump riots? We don't know the answer yet. There are already investigations into certain tours of the Capitol that happened in the days leading up to the riots. And we're still trying to figure out why would there be any tours since the Capitol has been restricted because of the pandemic. That doesn't make any sense. So many more questions remain unanswered, I guess, is the way I would put it. Now, the position of the right continues to be, 
a, a, a sort of conflicting mix of talking points. These were fake Trumpists who rioted on January 6th. But at the same time, we heard from Ron Johnson that if they were real Trumpists, they weren't a threat to anybody like him because they are patriots who wanted what's good for the country, which conflicts with they weren't actually Trumpists. Um, and they also had no plans to do anything wrong, except they did because just being there was a crime. You know how the right loves to say undocumented, the, all undocumented immigrants are criminal aliens because it's illegal to be here for them. Being here undocumented is a crime. Why does it matter what they were doing at the Capitol? Just forcing your way inside is destruction of property and trespassing. As they like to say about undocumented immigrants, it's a crime just to be there under those circumstances. But of course, very different rules apply to pro Trump insurrectionists than to undocumented people coming over the U.S. Mexico border. So the next question is, will we I mean, it's a question for you. It's a question for us to think about. Will there be any definitive linking of these pro Trump members of Congress to the planning and organization of the January 6th riots. And there's a lot of speculation on this. There are investigations going on. Uh, and then the, the sort of follow up question is if there are pro Trump Congress people linked to the planning of the riots, will there be any consequences? Because if anything has become the sort of default norm in the United States political world, it's that for many elected officials, particularly re Republicans, because their own party is unwilling to hold them accountable. There's just no consequences for things that in the past there would be significant consequences for. Let me know what you think. And of course, we'll continue following the investigations. Bad news for Donald Trump's former personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. He may be facing felony charges. The website Law and Crime is now reporting that Fulton County, Georgia District Attorney Fannie Willis is reportedly looking into whether her office can prosecute Rudy Giuliani over a series of false statements and conspiracy theories that he was peddling during a session of the Georgia State Legislature late last year. Remember that tour that Rudy did during which he ultimately got coronavirus, um, where he was doing all sorts of events at state legislatures, filing court uh, uh, complaints and all sorts of different things. According to the Daily Beast, with an anonymous source familiar with the matter, Willis is researching whether Georgia Code 161020 could be applied to the things that Rudy said before a Georgia Senate panel in December of 2020. Rudy told a Republican group of legislators, quote, you were the final arbiter of who the electors should be and whether the process is fair. The other way to look at it is it's your responsibility if a false and fraudulent court is a count is submitted to the United States government. And it's clear the count you have right now is false. And what Rudy was claiming was that there were two hundred and thirty one thousand odd ballots together with no return record at all that one hundred and thirty four thousand votes were thrown out. But, quote, you kept ninety six thousand votes where there was no return record for them. Rudy implying that there were phantom votes. And uh, of course, all of these claims were very quickly debunked, even by Republican elected officials in Georgia. But the question is whether Rudy Giuliani here uh, may have committed a felony by intentionally misleading senators as well as the people of Georgia and the United States perpetuating the disinformation. And under the law in question, it is a crime to knowingly and willfully falsify, conceal or cover up a material fact or to make a false, fictitious or fraudulent statement or representation before any department or agency of state government. Now, in general, these laws are used to prosecute people who are interviewed during investigations and they say things that are untrue, knowingly untrue. And it makes it similar to you're not allowed to lie to federal agents. And there are other Trump associates at the federal level who have been wrapped up uh, because of that. Uh, it's not 
typically used in this exact way. But what Rudy Giuliani did in the aftermath of the 2020 election, as well as Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis and others, is also not typical. So there is no question that this would be it would be significant if the D.A. chose to go after Rudy Giuliani on this. It would be a big expansion of investigation uh, by district attorneys within a state. Uh, but certainly uh, Rudy Giuliani here could be in a significant legal issue. And listen, even if it doesn't go very far, the possibility of it going places is likely to lead uh, to to require Rudy Giuliani to be uh, well represented by counsel and uh, MAGA making attorneys get attorneys, everybody around Trump needing to hire their own attorneys, even Trump's own lawyers. Now, if it ever comes to it, I am completely convinced that Rudy is going to sort of adopt the position of Sidney Powell and Tucker Carlson, which is no reasonable person would believe what Rudy said to be true. Doesn't necessarily mean Rudy was lying, but it certainly suggests that, as Fox News lawyers have argued, when Tucker says things that don't uh, uh, correspond to the facts, it's because it's hyperbole. It's a performance. It's an entertainment program. He shouldn't be expected to be saying things that are factual. When Sidney Powell said Dominion voting systems, this and, uh, you know, electors uh, 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 that and all of this other stuff um, that nobody should have believed that what she was saying was factual, really, because she sounded pretty serious when she was saying it. I assume that that's the, the defense that Rudy would take. And what's amazing is I've already heard a reaction to that from Trumpists who are saying, listen, Sidney Powell still believes that it was stolen. And Sidney Powell was serious when she said the election was stolen. This is just an election defense saying no one really could have believed that as a legal defense is just a legal defense. So she doesn't get in trouble. We all know the Trumpists and QAnon people are saying, we all know that the election was stolen and she was telling the truth, but now she's only saying this to get out of legal trouble. Now, what's interesting is obviously the election wasn't stolen, but it's certainly Sidney Powell seems bonkers enough that she really may believe the election was stolen and she really may be using this legal defense to get out of legal trouble. That's possible, but that doesn't make it true. As we now know, there is no evidence whatsoever that the 2020 election was stolen. We have a voicemail number and that number is two one nine two David P. Uh, here's a really nice voicemail. This is the occasional nice voicemail. Um, and it's from a therapist who says the show, the David Pakman show to her is like therapy for therapists. What a nice message to send. Take a listen to this. Hey, Pacman. Uh, my name is Leanna Smith. I am a mental health therapist here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I just wanted to reach out to you, first of all, to um, commend you on the spectacular job that you do every day. Thank um, you. When I come home from work, put on YouTube, I put your show on any of your recordings, and I just come to realize that you are my therapy. So Pacman is the therapy to the therapist. Wow. And I just wanted to share that with you. I think that is hilarious, but... Um, no, you do actually um, enlighten me a lot, and I appreciate um, all the viewpoints that you share throughout your show, different aspects on everything. You um, actually bring value to a lot of the crap that's going on in the world today. So I just wanted to send a shout out to thank you um, from Charlotte, North Carolina. Keep doing your thing, Pacman. Wow, uh, a perfect voicemail if I've ever heard one. I really do appreciate that. Many mental health professionals are in the David Pakman show audience, ranging from social workers to psychologists, L A L M H C's and uh, psychiatrists. Even it's a it's a broad range of mental health professionals. And I really do appreciate that. We have a great bonus show for you today. It appears as though Vice President Kamala Harris is going to be leading White House efforts to stem migration at the border. What will that look like? We also now are seeing 12 attorneys general calling on Facebook and Twitter to remove anti vaxxers from their services. Uh, where will that go? And lastly, remember how Donald Trump let let that wacky right wing network OAN 
um, into the White House. That is now Joe Biden's problem, and it's very interesting what is going on. So all of those stories and more, including previews of next week's show vacation on today's bonus show, you can get instant access to the bonus show by becoming a member at joinpacman.com. And very important, okay? We're off next week. The show's not canceled. Don't worry. I know that every time we take some time off, I get about 100 emails saying what happened. There's no show. Is it canceled? What we're just taking a week off next week. We'll be here tomorrow. I'll be live today for the Joe Biden press conference. But next week we are off. All right. So bonus show in moments show tomorrow. No show next week. Thanks a lot for watching today's show. I just want to take a second to tell you about today's sponsors. Blinkist is the app that helps you become a more well-rounded person by letting you read or listen to an entire nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. You can try it for free and get 25 percent off a subscription by going to Blinkist.com slash David Pakman.